Hello everyone, we'll just give everyone a few more seconds to go ahead and log in before we start. All right, well, hello everyone. This is D London and welcome to the Tremble Business Center Power Hour where we talk about all things TBC and TBC related. Today's Power Hour will address the latest updates and tools relating to macros for Trimble Business Center. And we do have all attendees in listen only mode, but we welcome all questions and comments. So feel free to type them into the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and the reps will respond accordingly. We will also be recording this session. So please look out for a link to the recording so that you can re-watch the recording and also share that with any of your friends or colleagues. And with us today, we have Nick Fiferic, the CEC Software Regional Sales Specialist, and Alan Sharp, the Marketing Director and Partner of Rockpile Solutions, whom will present the latest capabilities available using TBC macros with your, within your workflow. And during today's webinar, we'll discuss the recent updates with TBC macros and how they'll assist you in building models, calculating takeoff quantities, report generation, and organizing your data, just to name a few. And it's always a pleasure having Alan Sharp's expertise on any TBC subject matter. So I'll hand it over to Alan to lead us into what's new in the world of TBC macros. So thank you, Alan. Let me go ahead and hand it over to you. Launching a poll real quick. And Alan, you have presenter. Okay, can you see my screen okay? It's one sec, pulls up still. Okay, closing it in 10 seconds. Okay, Alan, you should have the screen. Are you seeing my screen already? Because I didn't get a share screen. One second. Let me put it back to here and let me go here. Now, do you see it now? Yep, I do now. Okay. Yep. Okay. So you got my screen now? Yes. We. It's your desktop, your main screen. Screen yep. one. Uh, okay. All right. So um, welcome everybody to this uh, Power Hour. Hopefully in the next uh, hour, we're going to give you an update of all the things that Rockpile Solutions have been doing with Trimble to build out this macro library and uh, refine it and make it better as a user experience for you. So uh, in the session here, we're gonna cover um, the prerequisites for using macros in TBC, just to make sure that everybody's aware of what you need in TBC to be able to use macros once you've uh, downloaded and installed them. We're gonna go through what's new in the macros um, in terms of a lot of, a lot of changes we've been making uh, that will be pushed out live over the next seven days. Uh, gradually, we're not doing it in one jump. We're going to be pushing bits out over the next seven days. So by next Wednesday, the whole system that you're going to see here will be live for everybody. Um, then we're going to go through the latest TML macro tools and show you the latest things that we've been developing and some of the changes and improvements we've been making. And then uh, we'll hand back to DeLondon. He'll do a summary of next steps and wrap up at the back end. We'll also cover things like pricing and configuration and things if you're interested in looking at that going forward. On the right hand side here in this uh, screen, you can see some of the changes we're making. Alan, we yep. are not seeing your, we're only seeing your desktop. Yep, where your mouse is. Presentation. Oh, yep. okay, sorry. Let's just make sure. Screen. Is that better now? Yes, got it. That's yep. Better. Okay, apologies. Yep, okay, that's PowerPoint. All right. That's good. Yep. Yeah. On the right hand side of this screen now, you'll see some of the changes we've been making. So, We've invested heavily in trying to improve the look and feel of the macros and the way that they install. So you'll see during this presentation that we've inc um, included all of the macros now into a three menu structure that will be part of a standard menu system that incorporates every TML from Trimble and Rockpile solutions. 
and we've added the ability to put in third-party DMLs as well. Every icon, every uh, tool now has its new own fresh icon that is differentiated a little bit from the Trimble icons for the core product. So it's clear to you as a user that you're using icons or using commands that are TMLs versus commands that are core product. You can see some of those icons in the menu, a little snapshot we have at the top of the screen. You can also see that we've incorporated the iconology into the forum pages that we're using for help systems. So you'll see as we go through the presentation, I'm gonna show you the help systems that we've been putting together for every single TML. So when you click F1, where you're in a TML, you'll get taken to a, a help page for the forum. And that forum will basically give you not just a description of the command, detailed instructions on how to use the command and videos of how to use the command in practice, but also some use case demonstrations where we've got real life data from maybe customer projects that we have used for creating videos to show you the complete workflow in context. So you'll see there's a complete change in the user experience from the start point where you're using TML status all the way through the use of the command and in terms of some of the quality of the outputs that you're generating. And we're gonna show you some of that in one hour. We can't by any means show you everything, but uh, hopefully this gives you a taster of uh, what we've been up to with Trimble to get this uh, up to a high level. Okay, so um, to start using macros in Trimble Business Center, you have to have um, uh, advanced survey edition or higher. The macro capability is locked to that edition, so you can't run macros in any lower version of the software, but it works in anything above that. So things like the site construction, site modeling, or the uh, infrastructure edition, or the utilities module, all of those will work with the macros that we're gonna show you today. And you can use it with versions from 5.0 and higher, but we still recommend that you use the current version of Business Center because things change with each release of Business Center and we update the macros and we're supporting uh, the 5.3 is our recommended version at this point in time. So to give you a kind of an overview of what we've been doing, so Rockpile Solutions, we started working on this back in February with Trimble. And we've been uh, partnering with Trimble to develop these and enhance these. And we've agreed that with Trimble, we will take over the support maintenance and development of all TMLs with them. Um, and so uh, you'll see that this, uh, this change is a significant enhancement in the Trimble Business Center experience with these extension tools. So together we've defined a new look for all the macro commands. We've rationalized the macro menus so that they when the macro is installed, they always go in the same place. They go in the right place. They go in a logical location. We've improved and updated many of the macro commands already, and we're continuing to improve those. So over the next 30 to 60 days, you'll see updates to pretty much all the macros as we go through the rationalization process for each one. We've added a number of new commands, which we're going to highlight and showcase today. Uh, we've provided an online help system and video documentation for all of the macro commands. There's some of that's still work in progress but we hope that that will all be finished by the end of this week. Um, and then we've connected all the macro commands to the TML status for easy TML management so that you can find an easy way of downloading, installing, managing, and maintaining your macro library uh, and keeping it up to date and keeping it fresh. And we've also provided an e-commerce system for the licensing and the purchasing of the toolboxes that we've put together here. And so our collective goal and vision between Trimble and Rockpile is that we'll provide a growing library of extension commands that make you more efficient, that increase your productivity and enhance your deliverable outputs. We're trying to be responsive to the market needs outside of normal development cycle timeframes. There's a lot of daily requests on the product. The product team at Trimble is trying to focus on, you know, future developments or bigger picture developments. And there's a lot of sort of day-to-day -day stuff that gets requested and uh, we're trying to pick up on some of that day-to-day -day stuff. But in addition, Rockpile is also trying to build its own uh, significant capability products. And you'll see some of those today, uh, first release of those. And we're trying to provide value-added services to the civil engineering construction community on a global basis. So there's a lot of localization needs around the world. There's a lot of sort of standardization that's required in different markets. And it's almost impossible for any one business to actually create all of that. So we're trying to help fill that void a little bit and be the responsive reactive partner to help Trimble achieve some of that customization and localization. And we're trying to build a network of developers that help us to do that from Trimble, from a uh, Rockpile Solutions perspective. So we now have developers in Russia, 
We have developers here in the UK, in the US, and we have developers in the UK right now. And we're working on a partnership with a, um, hopefully with a partner in Germany as well. So we'll be able to cover more international markets with a development standpoint. And there's also a development partner in Australia as well. So hopefully that's, you're going to see a network of uh, TML developers or TML customizers that can do some of your localization, but hopefully pushing it all through this same approach going forward. So what you'll see as you go through the, the, uh, the presentation today, you'll see a new look. And we've developed all of the sort of iconology for the product in both light and dark looks. Now, there is no dark mode in TBC today. We've added a, a darker look, which is more like the traditional look. And we're talking about how do we do a dark look for TBC going forward. But we've developed the light look for the TBC platform to run on the light gray background that is the traditional approach of TBC. And we've developed the dark look icon so we can use them on our forums and on our mobile device uh, forum. And also in the event that there's a dark mode ever created in TBC that we have them already prepared. The TML icons carry a flash of orange, as you can see here. So they're using the same design standards as the Trimble icons, but they're using a flash of orange as opposed to a flash of blue. And that way, when you're running a command, if it's got a flash of orange, you know it's a TML. If it's a flash of blue, you know it's a Trimble core product. And so you know whether you're working with a Rockpile function or a, a TML function versus a Trimble core product function. The icon design, um, as I say, has been prepared for both these looks to give us the, the, if you like, the marketing collateral or the user interface collateral that we need to go forward. So we've taken the approach that um, on the macro development and where we're putting the macro tools and how we're putting them into menus and toolboxes, we've taken the approach that, you know, whether you're a surveyor, whether you're a 3D modeler, whether you're an estimator, you all have similar processes. They're not identical and your outputs and deliverables may be different. But in general, we all go through the same process. So if you're doing processing of survey data or you're building a 3D model for machine control or you're doing a takeoff for estimating, you go through these same three basic steps, which is you know, data prep, which is importing, cleanup, editing of data, sorting and managing your information, creating and editing additional data. So any tool that kind of does that kind of stuff is now housed in the data prep toolbox. In the modeling arena, you have building surfaces, calculating volumes, you know, working with cross sections to generate 3D models for estimating, working with corridors, and then generating reports like volume reports or point list reports or point cloud reports, and also generating deliverable outputs like drawings, um, PDF outputs, et cetera. So we've put all of that capability into what we call the modeling toolbox. And then currently we don't have any critical mass in other areas, but we have a number of tools that kind of don't fit the data prep, don't fit the modeling. So we've put those into what we call the tool shed. And the tool shed is, if you like, a, a think tank, if you like, it's a, an evolving business area where if we develop tools that don't belong in the other two toolbox, rather than just sticking them in there because there's nowhere else to put them, we put the tool shed up as a place where we could put new tools, maybe that don't have a a kind of a real work process involvement, like an exporter, for instance, for MOS systems, for instance. We'll put that into the tool shed for the time being until such a time as we have a critical mass around it that makes sense to make a new toolbox or that we can make a new set of functionality that we can create another menu out of. And in the tool shed today, you'll find our core, what we call core tools, which are included in everything, which includes things like the TML status. It includes things like the show line direction setup and management the menu manager that we're just introducing today um, and various other things in there then you have the tools like exports to the mx system and then a few specialty tools which were developed for specific requirements for for instance a subdivision layout or something like that where we've created some tools but they don't really fit in anything else but they're licensable individually and also macro programming tools for developers so we're supporting the building of tools and the building of library tools that developers can utilize within their TMLs to use our capabilities to do things like show line direction on a drawing, for instance. And so with these three toolboxes, this is how we've structured the menu. So when you get into the software, you'll find that there are three menus, the macros now, and they look like this. 
So you'll get the data toolbox menu, the modeling toolbox menu, and the toolshed menu, and you'll find that the um, commands are all laid out in a logical order. So you'll find that they're in groups. So for instance, in the toolbox for data prep, you'll find the layers group, which is working with management, managing layers or relayering information. There's the view group, which is, for instance, lock views, which allows us to take two plan views and lock them together, showing different information in the two views. And as you pan and zoom in one, it pans and zooms the other. So you can see the same information in both screens in real time. Selecting data, you know, whether it be filtering data out by following an alignment or extracting data from a point cloud using boundaries. And then the modification tools, so exploding things, adjusting things, converting things from one form to another, all of those kind of tools would go into the modify group. And then the create and edit group, which is creating data from scratch. So things like creating points using radial scripts, using station and offset input, placing blocks placed parallel or in, in an angle to an alignment. All these kind of tools are creation tools. They're not building a model per se, but they're actually building the components that will then be used for modeling purposes. So that's the data prep functionality. When we get into modeling, now you see surfaces and volumes, cross sections, corridors, and the drawing creation tools like legends, and also the reporting outputs, things like generating reports for surface areas and volumes and stuff like that. And then the tool shed, as I said earlier on, it has our cool core tools like TML status, the menu manager, show line direction, commands using voice command, and then some of the tools that don't belong anywhere else, like the MOS exporter, adjust area, compute lot, set, lot setback, renaming drill holes for drilling and piling, and stuff like that, that we're developing for either consulting agreements with Trimble, or we're developing them for a specific customer request or for general market needs in a local market like MX Export was developed primarily for the Australian, the UK, Middle East markets where the MOS MX system from Bentley is still used quite heavily. So we developed an exporter for that, but that's also relevant to people, for instance, using Trimble Access Road Strings for doing road stakeout. And all these things are covered in the help systems when you go onto the web forum to, to see that. So what I'm gonna do now is before I get into the sort of packaging and pricing type stuff, I'm gonna jump into TBC 5.3 and give you an overview of some of the, the changes and highlight some of the new, new, new tools that are available. So you get a chance to kind of see these in practice. So I'm just gonna run up TBC. I've got a number of like small demonstrations here that I wanna give you that will give you a feel for some of the things that we're doing. So let's start off by looking at the menus that we just talked about. So here you can see the three menus. They've all got the little R in front of them, uh, which is orange. So you can see these are the standard Trimble Business Center menus. These are the three uh, uh, macros menus. And you can still customize the menus. You can still take these commands and move them anywhere else. But when we standardize the implementation of this and deliver it and install it for the first time, you'll find that these commands all listed on uh, the you know in the right places uh, directly. You'll find that there's a data prep menu, the modeling menu, and the tool shed menu. So let's go to things like TML status. Let's take a look at what's happening there. The TML status is your gateway to all TMLs. You can download the TML status uh, command from the Rockpile Solutions website. And when you've downloaded, installed it, you'll see that there's a that there will be a new look that will be pushed live in the next sort of 48 hours. And this new look basically takes what we had before, but puts it into a new, uh, a new look, uh, a new look and feel. And we'll be changing the sort of table entry stuff uh, over the next uh, week or so. But in here, you can see a list of all the TMLs that are available. Here, you can check that you want to update individual TMLs. Here, you can see whether the TMLs are licensed or not. So you can sort these columns to see whether they're licensed or they're not licensed. You can see the version that's installed on your computer. You can see the latest version that's available. That's the latest release version. And then if there's a test version and you're a beta test user in this column, you'll see that there's test versions of this command available. And then you can check to say you want to download and install those. And once you've installed those, then you'll see it's a test version in development. That's the one that you're currently using. If you want to remove the test version from your system, you can just check that checkbox. And when you do the update TMLs, it will download and install the release version, latest release version and replace the test version on your computer. So this tool provides you all of the uh, access to the TMLs 
that you need. If you need to change your user information, then you can go in here and enter your user information. If you're trying to toggle in here, if you look at the status, here you can see the status of all your uh, TMLs sorted by the status. And if there's something that you want to install, you can toggle over here, for instance, I want to install the ones that aren't installed, and then I would hit update TMLs, and that would install all the TMLs on my system. And it puts it all in the right place, overwrites all the files if it needs to, configures the system for you. And once you've done this, you'll need to do a restart of TBC because the TMLs are compiled at runtime, and so you need to start TBC to load the latest versions. If you want to get to the Rockpile website, you can. You can click here, and that will take you to the Rockpile website where you can license or see more information about the TMLs. If you want to know more about any particular TML in here, let's just go down to the MOS exporter, for instance. If I go to this one, then you go to our forum, and the forum has a help page for every TML. And so in here, you'll find command description, command interface descriptions. You'll also find at the bottom uh, of the page here, this is a long one because there's a lot of information in the GenIO exporter. But here you'll find a video that when you play that video, that video has a complete detailed overview of how to use this command. Every single step, every single process is documented video wise. And you've got a voiceover that talks about how to use it properly and stuff. So here you can see the kind of example. And then beyond that, there's in some cases use case videos where we've put it in context where you can see the use cases. And then in other cases, there might be some additional background information posts and some additional work process videos that we've added for the benefit. And if you're looking to try it out or you want to see how to use it, there's example data down at the bottom. And then there's a PDF file that is the document. If you want to download and print something, you can download and print the document and print it off in your own time. So you see this is the approach for everything. And you can go in here and just change which toolbox you want to look at. So you can look at the data prep toolbox. You can look at the modeling toolbox. And in here, every command is written in the same way. So you'll find every command has got the icon, it's got the title, and it's got all that same information stored with it. So that's the, that's the help approach in here. And you'll get that help approach whenever you run a command or you're in the TML status where you try to connect to it from the website. So this is the kind of uh, work that's been going on to provide a better user experience, a better user interface, a better structure of the system. So rather than having a lot of commands that have the same icon, that have the wrong names, have the wrong tooltips, everything now has correct tooltips, correct names, and everything else in here. We just need to run TMR status. Open that. Okay, so we can close this out now. So. Let's take a look at a couple of the commands, a couple of the tools that are available. The first thing is to look at menu manager. So we've added menu manager so that you can, uh, for example, uh, go to the color scheme and you can, if you want to change the color scheme in the background here, some people didn't like the fact we took that away in the product. So we've added it back here. And if you change it from default to dark, you can do that. And this command is free of charge. We're not charging for this menu management command because it's part of the system installation. And you need to be able to sometimes reset the, the, the menus. And if you hit reset, it will reinstall these three menus in the right way with all the structure that we have currently set up in that menu management tool. And we'll manage that menu as we release more and more tools. So that's the menu manager. It's a kind of a nice tool and it manages the, the look and feel. And this will do more things as we develop uh, the menu management functionality. Second thing is the, these other tools like show direction. That's a setup tool that allows you to define how a line is described when you actually click on one. So in this case, if I click on this line, you can see the show direction and you can show the start and end flags. You can define the, right, the left and right colors for the iconology here in the plan view or in the 3D view. You can determine whether this is segments or moving based and moving based, you can see a little flashing cursor. I recommend the segments because it's easier to see in general. And you can change the scaling of the arrows. You can also change the transparency of the, the arrows to get it as you see fit. And once you've set this up, you can, you can save this configuration by pressing okay. And then when you run any other command, like for example, the nudge command or the define extra stations command or any of the others, we're now implementing this uh, show direction into all of the TMLs where a line direction is necessary to determine right or left direction. So it's a tool that we develop. You can basically uh, configure it with this command 
and then it gets leveraged by any other command in any of these other menus where a direction is necessary. Okay, so I'm going to show you first off a new tool called Place Align Blocks, and this is one that we you can see this is the only tool, of course, that's grayed out on the menu for some reason. We've got a couple of little uh, teething problems still that we're ironing out, and hopefully this will be done by the end of the week. So this one command, I'm just going to have to run it from the uh, command pane. So I'm just going to just show you a couple of things in the command pane uh, to see this. Now, all Trimble TMLs, they start with an underscore. So if you type underscore, you'll get a list of all the Trimble TMLs uh, at the start here. If you type in RPS, every, every Rockpile TML starts with RPS. So you can see very quickly, I can get to any RPS command or any Trimble command if you know the source, if that's important to you. In addition, you can type in just any word, like any time you can, like I want to find the place align block. So that's RPS place align blocks. If I run that command, it will pop up here. Now, give a bit of background. This command is origin, uh, came from a um, customer that was doing a lot of noise wall installation. And they approached us and said, it would be nice if we could find a way of automating the process of building the models. They also use site vision augmented reality and they wanted to find a way of creating the drilled shafts and the posts and the anchor bolt layouts for noise wall locations. This is a canned example. It's got a line, it's got different directions. It's got points at the locations where the posts will be. If I look at this in 3D, what this person does is they create these points in an Excel spreadsheet based on what's on the plans. And then they define a series of blocks. So this is the bottom of the drilled shaft. And you can see in some cases it's shallower than it is over here, then it's shallower again. Here's the top of the drilled shaft and it's also the bottom of the post. And here's the top of the post. And this is also the location of the anchor bolts. And if we look at a plan view again, if I zoom up here, this is kind of what they want to achieve. So you'll see that there's two circles. One is slightly smaller than the other one. So the bottom one is the uh, base of the drilled shaft. The top one, the orange one is the top of the drilled shaft. We've made them a hundredth difference in size. So when we place them, we can build a surface model directly out of those. The anchor bolt plate is the green plate with the four anchor bolt locations. And then you've got the posts. And again, with the post, we've got the red line is the bottom of the post and the blue line is the top of the post. Now we've defined those as a series of blocks with a series of names and those names match the point names that we have over here. So if we give these points, for instance, a name, if I click on this one, you'll see this one is drilled shaft base or DSB. DST would be drilled shaft top, AB for anchor bolt, PB for post bottom, PT for post top. Now, if you name the blocks the same as the feature codes, then when you run this command, you can do things like this. You can say, pick the alignment. You can define a default block so these names don't match up with blocks in the in the file. You can place a default block on it. You can define a default layer as well if you want to. I'm just going to put them on layer zero. You can define an angle of rotation to the alignment. So what it's going to do is it's going to place the blocks in the location, but then orientate the block to the uh, alignment location at that point. Now, if the point is here, then this is the direction, and this would be right angles to the direction. But if you get to a corner point, then the, um, the orientation of that corner is the half angle. So it basically rotates things to the half angle in the point here. You can put in a rotation. If you want to skew everything to 20 degrees, for example, you can put in a skew angle here. Elevation, it is derived from the points. But if the points don't have an elevation, you can enter an elevation here. You can type in coordinates and just snap using snaps, for example. So if you want to place a block using near point, you can do that. So as you now go in here, if you snapped here, it would place this block at that location. But you can also go in here and say, select the points. So I'm just gonna pick the points and you can pick them by layer or you can just pick them graphically. So it picked all those points. So you can see now if I go here, it's picked the bottom of the shaft, the top of the shaft, the bottom of the post, the top of the post and all the anchor bolt locations. And then I can say, use the point feature code for the block. That's gonna say, match the block to the feature code and hit apply. And so what it's done now is it's put that outer circle here, the inner circle here, the anchor bolt here, and the post bottom here, and the post top up here. So once you've done that, now you can say, okay, I want to build surface models from that. So now you can say, pick all this data here, close this, and I want to explode all the blocks. And so I've got 121 blocks, so I want to delete the blocks after exploding, so I'm going to do that. 
So that just converted all the blocks and all the blocks were defined on the right layers. So now if I go over here to the view filter, I can turn off the sound wall and just say, let's take a look at the drill shaft base and the drill shaft top. Let's also turn off the points in that layer here. And so now if I look at this in 3D, I've got all of the, the block locations, all the point locations here. So I can now pick these, uh, where's the, where's two? yeah, so I've got all my blocks that I need them. So I can pick all those and I can make them into a surface model. And we can give it a color and we can say, pick all these points and say, okay, now it's gonna build me a surface model that goes beyond the posts. But what I can do now is turn off the top of the posts here and go to surface boundaries. Let's turn off the surface a second and then pick all these point, these circles from the base of the shaft and add them as boundaries. And now I've got the drilled shaft uh, surface is created. Now with this surface model, then I can go in here and say, let's make that by surface color. So I've now got gray for the poke for those. Now I can do the same thing for the posts. So just do the top and bottom of the posts, turn off the drill shafts, find all the symbols for this, and then make a surface out of those. And that's called a, oh, I can use surface out of this. Let's call it posts. And let's make these red. And let's pick those points and say, okay, apply. And again, do the same thing pick the bottom of the posts. And let's add those as boundaries. So add a move surface boundaries to the post layer and hit add. And so now we've got the post data created as well. And again, with that surface, we might want to change that to by surface color as well. And so now we've got red posts and gray shafts, and we've also got the anchor bolt locations. And we can turn on all the other line work as well if we wanted to, and we can turn on the sound wall and build that if we needed to. So now we've got all of the drill shafts, all the posts for the sound wall. Now we can save this out as a VCL file and take that out to site vision augmented reality. We can take this out to the field systems for survey and stakeout. So we can take out the anchor bolt locations or we can take out the post information. So this is now satisfying the workflow for both site vision augmented reality and also for site works for doing stakeout or for Trimble access, whatever happens, whatever you happen to be using. And you've got surface models here that you can use to calculate the quantities of the concrete, quantities of the steel, the posts, or whatever you might have to do from that information. So it gives you an example of what we're trying to do with the macros is not really just try to write a macro to solve a specific problem, but try to create a workflow around it that allows you to take that new created object directly to the field with a high value uh, model that provides more value than just a visual, but also for all of the stakeout and checking and validation needs. Okay, so that's place aligned blocks. Let's jump to the next one. And we're gonna take a look at um, the, uh, what we call the matrix copy command. We had a lot of requests to do sort of matrix copies for a number of things. So I'm just gonna open up a project here. I'm gonna use the matrix copy command. And let's say no to that. It's a great example of a small CAD, CAD tool that can be used for just copying things. So you could use this command, for example, for creating parking stripes and parking lots. You could use it for creating um, uh, piers or foundations in a building where it's on a regular grid. You could use it for building staircases. You could use it for a, a whole host of different requirements. And we looked at this and decided to take it a little bit further than just doing a simple matrix copy. So the matrix copy command is in the data prep menu. It's here in the create and edit section. So we got a matrix copy. And in here, we can now select the object that we want to copy. This one right here. And then we get where we want to copy it from and where we want to copy it to. So let's take a look in the plan view. Let's just go over here. And we want to copy it from this location right here at the bottom left-hand corner. And we want to copy it to where. So in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to type in a coordinate location for this and say we want to place it at uh, 10, comma, zero, uh, comma, 100. And here we want to place the, the bearing. So this is going to ask me now for the bearing of the column. So the column bearing, in other words, we want the columns to come this way, the rows to go this way. So I'm going to put a bearing of 90 degrees in for this. We can put in a vertical angle, which means we can put these on a slope if we want to. 
and we can say we want five columns, for example, and we want the columns to be spaced by 10 feet increments. Then the row uh, direction, we want it to be zero, but we can put in a skew angle. So it doesn't have to be a rectangular grid. It can be a skew grid. We can put in a slope in here if we want to. So I'm gonna put in a slope just for uh, the hell of it. And we're gonna put in the number of rows we want is 10. And in here, we want the spacing, and we want the spacing in this case to be 7.5, for example. But in addition to doing a normal grid and a skewed grid, we've also added the ability to put in, for instance, multiple levels. And then you can space the levels out vertically as well. And when I hit apply here, what it's gonna do there is it's gonna build me an array of that data. And if I go to the 3D view, you can see that it's built me the array on a 45 degree slope with everything having a top and bottom for each pair of data. Now, again, that could be used for the building of surface models or whatever else. And you could do the same thing for building staircases or any other kind of feature where you have an X, a Y, and a Z element where you want the top and the bottom of the object. And this allows you to do a lot of really fairly complex uh, array type calculations in a very quick manner. You can also use this for doing things like site mass hall, where you want to put a grid on the drawing. You can place one block and then copy it multiple times across the drawing and then delete the ones you don't need. So this is a nice tool for automating the process of creating uh, a lot of different types of information. As I say, parking stripes, mass hall grids, building foundations and piers are good examples of when this would be used. Okay, so let's dive to the next, uh, the next function, which is what we call the nudge command. I'm just gonna open up another, another project here and let's go to the nudge line, nudge node command. And this is a set, another set of canned examples of where the nudge line and nudge node command would be used. Um, when you're doing things like cross-section work or you're working with um, things like retaining walls, you're often given lines at the top and bottom of the retaining wall that are vertically separated, but in the same exact location. When you look at cross sections, you'll often find cross sections where the top and the bottom of a retaining wall is in the same location, but on the cross section line. And when you try to form a surface model from those, then they'll get flagged like all of these examples in this particular project. And they all show different examples. There's a building foundation where you've got the top of the wall and the bottom of the wall, and it's flagging because they're in the same location. Over here, you've got retaining walls where you've got the bottom of the wall, top of the wall, and the bottom of the wall, top of the wall, and you've got flags everywhere. Here you've got three vertical lines for let's say posts on a, on a panel wall and they're all vertical. So again, you can't form a surface from those. And then here you've got varying different examples of uh, problems that, that happen. So I've captured a lot of the kind of standard type issues so I can show you how the nudge command works. Nudge is in the modeling toolbox. It's right here and it has two main modes of working. It has the, show, the, the, the line mode and the point or the node mode along a line. So when you pick a line, Let's start over here with this retaining wall example. The fix to the problem is to move a line slightly. Now, if you used traditional TBC approach, you would have to do an offset line, delete the original line, add the offset line to the surface, and that would have fixed the problem. But if it wasn't enough, then you'd have to do it again until you get it right. The beauty of this approach is that you can pick the line that you want to nudge, and you can say you want to move the entire line. The show direction tells me it's going in this direction, so I want to move it to the left. And just you can down here, you can pick the nudge amount. So in this case, I'm moving at a hundredth. And I try to pick consistently the bottom or consistently the top, just so I know these are the lines I adjusted. By doing that, you just move the line. It kept it in the surface model. It updated the surface model and eliminated the flags directly. Now I can pick the next line, say the bottom of the wall here. It also wants to go left. Do the other side, pick this one. This one wants to go right. And then do the same thing for this wall and hit apply, and that's fixed that retaining wall. So very quickly, you can take a set of problems and turn them into something which is now working for you. The nudge node kind of works a little bit the same, but a little different. If I say move selected nodes, and then if I go in here and I pick a line, when I do that, let's just pick another line a second. Okay, when I say pick a, a line, you can go in here and you can pick, um, whether you want to move the upper nodes, the lower nodes, or no nodes at all. So you can say, use the lower nodes, for example. And when you pick the line, it analyzes the line for you and decides what to do with it. So it's going to go in here, pick this line here. And now what it's going to do, it's going to analyze where the flags are. And if, for example, the fix in this case, if you're saying lower nodes, the fix is to move this one forwards 
and this one backwards. So in this case, I'm going to merge them by that amount and say apply. And uh, why is this not picking up here? Back to this. Just run this command one more time, sorry. There we go. Okay, so now we've got this line. It's telling us this is the flag point. I'm moving the lower nodes. It's telling me I need to move one forward, one backwards. And when I hit apply, it fixes that. Now you can use the enter key to hit the apply button. So you can very quickly, rapidly move through a set of tools. For example, here's the next one, which has got the opposite case. It's got an embankment for, a, a, let's say, a retaining wall or something. Let's do this one again. Uh, why? Here we go. This one's a little different. This is where a typical case where you get the bottom of a wall and the top of the wall. Top of the wall here is okay, but down here it doesn't seem to be okay. So what you can do in this case is you can pick this line and you could move the entire line to the left, or you can say move the node and you can move it. Um, in this case, it's saying move it backwards, but in this case, you can also say, well, let's say move it to the left and say apply. And that, that would fix this problem. Same with this one. This one, you can say, let's move it to the left. And uh, let's say apply, and that fixes that one. These ones are kind of the same thing over here. Now you can, this one, it's a little trickier because you've got to move this node in a specific direction to make it correct. I just happen to know that this is 180 degrees. And by doing that, you fix this. You can choose the bearing and just use bearing snaps to calculate the right orientation for this. And so for each one, as you edit that, did I get that one wrong? Get that one. Do that again, 180. Yeah, okay, and then do this one as well. And then make that one 180 as well. And again, that one's fixed up very nicely now. So again, we can go back here. This one is a little more complex where you've got you know positives and negatives all in the same line, more than one pair of nodes with a problem. And again, you can hit apply and just do the same thing with these. And so very quickly you can see that we're fixing all these kind of problems in these kinds of lines. This one is a different one. You've got a building foundation line. In this case, I'm going to move the entire line and I want to move it to the right and say, okay, apply. And now that's fixed that. And now you've got a 3D model. So again, nudge line, nudge node, a nice way of fixing a whole host of problems with uh, different types of surface models and gets you to a finished model very quickly. Okay, so that's kind of give you an example of some of the tools. I want to do one more before we kind of go back to the, the kind of the, the, the packaging and the structure. There's not enough time to do all of them. But the, the biggest one that we've been working on is what we call geometric selection. So I'm just going to open another project here and try to give you a very quick overview of this one. So this one's for working with cross sections. And let's open this one. And in this case, what we're going to do is look at the problem of solving relayering of data, which come in as PDF cross sections. This is a sheet of a bunch of sheets from a big project in Cambodia that we were working on. And uh, in here, you get this kind of uh, data. And let's see, you got a plan set. So we've imported a number of sheets here. This, this project had literally thousands of sheets of cross sections. It was 200 and something kilometers long. And trying to work through this mechanically is extremely time consuming. So typically when you're working with data like this, if you're working one page at a time, which we didn't do in this case, we actually wanted to build it so we could work on hundreds of pages at once. In here, we could come in here, delete the data we don't need and get rid of this stuff first. And get rid of this. And so we looked at a number of things. If you look at the data here, if you look at exist the finished design line, oh, come in here, finished design line, and let's isolate that layer. What we're looking at here is all this data is nice and clean. So we could just pick this data and use the traditional layer method where you go in here and actually pull down this list and then go find the layer we want to put it on. And we can decide, okay, let's go find that, uh, put it on finish grade. And that's now relayed to a layer that's now turned off. If I unisolate this, now I'm left with the rest of the data. But if I try to look at it, okay, let's do existing terrain and isolate that layer. 
but you'll see it didn't make a difference because all this data, the text, the labels, the original ground, the subgrade, the median line, the, the over excavation, all of that data is on the same layer in this particular project. And you sit here going, okay, how am I going to get through hundreds of pages of cross sections very quickly <clears throat> by picking the data manually? You can do certain things like picking it like here and then using the relayer, but get, that gets real slow and real tiring after a little while. So we looked at how do we make this better for people? And the tool we created was a thing called geometric selection. And geometric selection has two modes. It has a text mode that allows us to take polyline text because this text in this drawing is, as you can see, polylines. There is no text in this drawing. And yet we need the station labels like this. We need these elevation labels like this to elevate all the data in every cross section. And so you either have to go through every cross section manually labeling the grid lines or manually labeling the elevation lines and then be able to process it. And on literally thousands of cross sections, that's a very time consuming process. So we started to look at how do we take polyline text and convert it into real text. I'm gonna try and show you how to do that very quickly. And I'm also gonna show you another tool which is for line selection. So we have a relayer command, which we wrote to make this easier to start off with. So our process here was let's write a command to relayer data and Instead of just picking an object and then going over here and saying you want to change its layer, let's build up a stack of layers. You can pick a layer from here, it adds it to this list, and then you can kind of go in here and say, well, all those lines are existing, apply. And then you can say, all well, these lines over here are existing, apply. You can use your enter key on this. Then the same thing over this side and the same thing on this line. And again, that's a lot quicker than trying to use the properties pane or the relayer command of Trimble because you can of, of TBC standard because you you have to kind of go into this properties pane every time you want to do something. Same thing applies to here, but it's a little tricky to get at this data because it's kind of intermixed with all this other text. So we wanted to find a way of saying, okay, well, let's try to use the geometry information about the lines that we're looking at to see if we can find a better way of relayering that. So we took this command and then moved it on to give us a further, more advanced tool called geometric selection. And I have to give Peter Kistler, my colleague, a, a huge kudos for this. This is a fantastic tool for getting through data. This took my processing time for 100 sheets down from two days, probably down to two hours. So it's talking about a massive change in production for you. So here we can pick lines, for instance. So I can go in here and just say, pick all this data down the center line and all this data down the center line here as well. And it gives you a list of all the lines and it gives you these properties like length, aspect ratio, which is the height to width ratio, the node, the number of nodes in the line, the serial numbers, the, the layer it's on, what type of line it is, et cetera. So you don't need to see this. It's good to kind of be able to look at it. But then we wrote this filtering capability. Let's just open this up. And the filtering capability works like this. You can say, you can define filter patterns and you'll see that when we get to text filtering in just a second. But here you can go into these different filters and apply them in combination or in isolation. So you can say, let's go into these uh, and turn off the filters I don't want. And now I can say, let's turn off at length and let's go to aspect filter because I want to find the vertical grid lines here. Vertical grid lines are vertical. That's the property they have. So we can go all the way over here, slide this slide bar, and you can see all the blue lines are what's just been selected. So now I can just tag the grid lines and say, put them on that layer. Now I can do the same thing for, for instance, the subgrade lines. So I can say, okay, let's now do a length filter and let's filter the line by length. So I need to pick more lines now. So let's go up here, pick all this data and you can say, let's pick by length. Now, if you were trying to filter out all the text data, then you could basically move this filter all the way down to the left. So let's grab it, move it down. And you can see it's highlighted all the text, all the little call outs, everything is now being picked, but I've left the top section, which are the longer lines, and they're the subgrade lines. So I'm just gonna move all this text stuff to a layer called text, apply, that layer will disappear. And then what's left behind is, if I use a length filter again, I can now just crank this up to the top. That's got this data and that's my subgrade apply. So very quickly in a few steps, now I could record those as scripts up here under the defined filter, then I can apply them because one of the things you'll see here, if I turn this layer back on again, you can find it, text items, 
when I did the text items, it also picked up the median ions, these things right here. And the median ions all have a same property. They all have the same length. For 200 kilometers on this road, they're all basically the same. And so you could basically say, okay, let's pick all these lines in this drawing. And this is just doing it one sheet, but I can do this on 100 sheets at one time. And so now I can say, let's so filter through all this. In this case, I'm going to use a pattern called median ion. And you can see instantly that pattern has picked up every median ion on the drawing. And now I can just scroll down here and say that belongs to median ion apply. And so now I'm left with the text object. So now I want to convert these text items to something that's usable. So what we went to then is said, okay, how do we automate that process and what can we do with that? We've tested this on a number of different projects and it works. Once you've, cap once you've characterized the characters, you basically can then sort for text. So in here, we've got all this text selected. And in here, we can set up filters using these controls. And so for instance, if I want to find the number one for elevations, you can see it's picked the number ones in my drawing. If I say pick the number zeros for uh, station labels, you can see it's picked the number ones, which are the bigger text items for station labels. Now you can do all the ones together because they've got the same number of nodes, they're drawn in the same direction, they've got the same aspect ratio, et cetera, because they're using the same character font. So you can go through and characterize all of the characters on a, on a page and then apply that characterization to all the pages in the drawing. And so what you can do now is you can say, okay, now I have to find all the patterns. Let's scroll down to the bottom here and let's say apply all these text filters and apply them. You can see it's flashing away right now while it's characterizing all the characters. And at that point now you go to the create text mode. In the create text mode, you can put in a character spacing and a word spacing. And then you can say, build me all the text strings. And so what it's done now is it's gone through all of that characterization stuff and built me all the text strings that I need. And now I can go in here. Now you, you'll see there's the odd one like this. And that's because these ones are drawn on a slope, not horizontally. So right now we're looking for text in a horizontal axis or a vertical axis. We're not looking for things on a slope right now because we're really only interested in looking for the stuff that's written horizontally on the drawing. And so in this case now, we can pick all these text items from the top to the bottom. There's ones you don't want, you don't have to select them. You can check one checkbox and it will highlight them all. And then I get to, the right, to write that text to a set of layers with a text font and I hit apply. And now that's converting all that text into text. So if I now turn off those text layers now, and isolate this and take a look at the converted text. Now I've got real station labels, real numerical values for elevations. Uh, and now I can use that for elevating all my lines and placing all the sections in stations. So again, it takes a few minutes or a little while to characterize all the characters, but once you've characterized it, you can then say, go to multi-sheet view, for example, here, and you can pick all the sheets now. So I can go in here and say, uh, I wanna go to right click, and hold the shift key down and go to new sheet view. And that will load me all five sheets in this case, but it could be a hundred sheets. And I can run that same process on all of that data for all of those sheets in one pass. It takes a few seconds longer to process it, of course, but because it's more data it's working through. But the beauty of this is you can rattle through now dozens and dozens of sheets in a go. Once you've characterized one sheet, typically you can apply that sheet to all the other sheets and characterize everything. So it gives you a power. This is a real power tool for stripping through cross sections to build 3D data that you can then use for modeling purposes and estimating purposes. And it solves some of the biggest problems that you see with CAD, which is the data isn't sorted onto layers. You've got polyline text, not real text, and you need to change it into something that's usable before you can work with it. And this is the kind of stuff that we're trying to do to assist and supplement what Trimble's doing with the mainstream product to try to give you some real power tools for working with construction. And there's a dozens and dozens of these new tools in this product. Uh, and hopefully that's gonna be something that's really useful. It's something for you, for everybody, for reporting, for view filter control for plotting purposes, for volume calculations and for reporting. So on that note, I'm gonna shift back to the presentation a second and just kind of finish up the last couple of slides before I hand it off to the London to kind of wrap up here. Okay, so having done the demonstration, all the previously released Trimble author TMLs have been updated. So they've all got the new icon, they've all got new names, new, new, new tool tips that are all relevant. Um, they all have, uh, they're all incorporated into the new menu structure, so they're mixed in amongst all of the TMLs from Rockpile. They're listed as components of the appropriate toolbox, but they still remain to be free. So Trimble TMLs remain free in their current format with all these updates that we've done to them. 
They're all supported and managed now through TML status. They all have help and video documentation using F1. The support and maintenance on those tools will now be provided for Trimble by, by Rockpile. And the existing versions, as I say, I want to stress that the existing versions of the tools will be free of charge. However, if we go in and we start spending a lot of time enhancing those and expanding those and making them more powerful, then they will the enhanced, more powerful versions will be incorporated into a toolbox and you'll be able to license those as part of that. But the free ones, as they are today, will continue to be free for the foreseeable future. I don't see that changing. Second piece I want to talk about here is the licensing structure. So the Trimble, the Rockpile tools that we had available before we did this, and with the tools we've just added here into this release, they remain licensed through the new toolbox structure. So we're changing from what was CAD modeling and takeoff toolboxes to this new structure, but we're grandfathering all of our existing users across to this new structure. And this basically summarizes what happens if you are using each tool. And so you can map what you're going to get, but you won't lose out of this. You'll have all the tools you had before and probably some extra ones based on the fact we're changing the, the, the system. We felt it was good to do it now rather than later, so that, and we felt like all our existing users will grandfather you in with all the new tools for the length of your subscription package as you have it today. So that does mean that if, you're, if you've already purchased or you purchase before we do the formal release of this, which will be probably next Wednesday, then any users that have purchased the TML libraries prior to the formal release date of the updated packages, means if you order them between now and next Wednesday, then you'll get the upgraded packages next Wednesday when we do the formal release at no additional charge, and you'll save yourself up to $185, about 20% on the new prices. The new prices, we've gone from $700 to $885, so it's not a massive step up to accommodate some of the new capabilities we've added at this point. And we don't intend to change the prices again this year. We intend that any new product that we develop in the next 12 months will be incorporated in these products. And if you take the all tools package, which means you buy everything, we guarantee that any tool we develop in your subscription period, you will get included in your package without, even if it's in a new toolbox, you'll get that before the end of the year. And the formal release date will be before the end of June, most likely June the 25th is our current uh, target date, but you can see a lot of it's already finished and ready to go today. Pricing, individual toolboxes have their own prices. So if you license the DataPrep toolbox, it's $295. The modeling toolbox is $395. Tool share is $195 per year. This is a subscription-based packaging. The all tools package, as I say, that comes with the additional guarantee if you buy that, that any tool we introduce, no matter which toolbox it goes into this year in your subscription period, you will get that if you take the all tools package. You can order those from rockpilesolutions.com website, or you can order them through your Trimble dealer. Both the Trimble SciTech and Geospatial dealers are welcome to order on your behalf, and we will work with your dealer to provide you the tools. Or as I say, if you want to deal directly with the website, you can do that too. Toolbox subscriptions include the TML support, the TML forum, all TML use for the subscription period, all the TML help documentation, and all TML maintenance for that 12 month period or subscription period as you have it. You can buy subscriptions for up to three years if you want to. All TMLs added to these toolbox in the subscription period will be added at no charge to you in, in, at the time when they're introduced. So TML status is used to manage all the tools. You've seen that in use, and you can get that from rockpilesolutions.com. And you need a Trimble ID to do that because we use Trimble ID as our authentication system. So you need to go to connect.trimble.com and do the sign up to get a Trimble ID if you don't have one. Rockpile Solutions community, this is available to you all. This is where the help system goes, but there's other information on here too. I'm trying to make sure this isn't conflicting with what we do on the Trimble forum for Trimble. Um, this is supplemental information. It covers uh, the, all of our tools. It also covers some other software products that we're bringing to market for uh, the web applications. And you can take a look at that if you're interested. Go to the Rockpile Solutions Forum if you need to. Um, but please go to the Trimble Forum for all TBC support. Um, we'll do all the support there with Trimble uh, on an ongoing basis. So please still use that. But look at this as an additional resource uh, as you see fit. And in this resource, you can communicate with me and also other Rockpile specialists and other users in our community about TMLs. So if you were talking about TML work or you want TML written or you want to uh, ask for an enhancement to an existing TML, you can post up uh, requests on here for enhancements and stuff and we'll take care of looking at those and respond to you through this forum. So we're trying to keep TML separated from TVC. You can ask them on the TVC forum, I'll still answer them there of course, but if you write them on here, then they're captured and they're looked at by our development team. 
Um, so learn about other products and services that Rockpile have as well if you're interested. This is the Rockpile Solutions website, and this is where you can order your TML toolboxes from. Just go to rockpilesolutions.com. In there, there's a toolbox menu. You can go in there and you can decide which tools you want to buy and license them through here. There's also an admin portal on here, which you can use to admin your licenses. And when you order, you'll get an email from us that talks about how to uh, set up and configure your licenses and stuff like that. So on that basis, I'm gonna hand off back to DeLondon and Nick. Thanks very much for your time and thanks for inviting me to talk today, DeLondon. Uh, really appreciate it. And uh, if you've got any questions, please contact me. Here's my email address and my cell phone. Most of you already know it, but please uh, feel free to reach out to me or your regional uh, Trimble rep, and they'll be more than happy to connect you and uh, answer your questions. There's a lot of uh, downloadable information already on the Rockpole forum. It's going to be updated over the next few days. So it will be complete, hopefully, by the time we release next week for every single TML. All right. Thanks, Dawn. Thank you, Alan. I, I appreciate it. That was a great presentation. Before we uh, go over the Trimble resources where you can find information about Trimble Business Center, I have one more quick poll for you all to, um, to fill out. I'm not seeing that. Thing. Uh, it should be popped up. Oh, it's probably because you're on the board. I'll uh, I'll share the I'll share the the results this afternoon for you. That's fine. If there's any questions, we can answer them here. Um, are let's see, are the subscriptions per user or Trimble USB or Hasp or per company? I don't so, know what that pertains to, though. I'm assuming yeah, you're... TML licenses. So TML yeah. licenses are per, are per user. You can buy a company license with a number of seats on it, and then you can assign those seats through the admin portal to whoever you want to assign them to. So they, they're changeable. You can move them around, but you can only have the number of seats running at any particular time that you own. So if you own five seats, you can have five people using it concurrently, um, but you can assign those seats to whoever you want in your organization through the admin portal. Awesome. And they're done, they're done through the TML status system. So. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you very much. That's all the questions that we've had at this point. So flip over to my screen. What screen are you guys seeing right now? Do you see my? I'm seeing yours, Nick. The presentation or just a blue screen? No, I'm seeing your other resources and next step screen. Yeah, okay, perfect. That. Thank Slide you. Down. Okay, perfect. Okay, so the other resources we have, so here's a couple of TBC pages that we uh, have that you can get uh, the download of the software itself or any information about it, such as uh, webinar information, customer stories, testimonials, uh, bullets, white papers, and downloads. Uh, you can find more information about Business Center and the use of Business Center on our uh, uh, YouTube web pages that would be accessible under the uh, support tab in Business Center. It'll take you directly to the page itself. Um, we hold uh, actually a decent amount of power hours. There more and more have been uh, posted and presented uh, in this in this time, um, both from the geospatial and construction side of things. So keep your eyes open on the news feed or any any type of um, emails that are coming in and get registered up to uh, learn uh, what's going on with Business Center. We have community pages uh, where you can post um, your your problems, needs, or successes online. Uh, we both uh, we have them separated both in the construction and geospatial uh, sections of the software, so you can get to the people and work with the people that you need based off the questions you have. Uh, business center being rather big, we had to do that and and uh, widespread throughout the industry. We have the TBC Macros community page. Um, uh, in addition to everything that you saw from Alan, uh, please take a look at that. And and uh, it's it's along the same lines as the actual forum page that I just mentioned before, where you can actually uh, post uh, post uh, requests and such like that. Lastly, for learning our uh, uh, for learning resources, we have the TBC Library, which is an online platform where we have data and videos for you to follow along uh, with and learn about Business Center and how it works. <clears throat> if you are interested in having purchased Business Center at this point, um, please please contact your local SciTech or geospatial dealer. Um, 
these are the these are the websites where you can actually find those those um, dealers or your closest dealer at and the download link for business center 5.3 Next week, we're going to be taking a look at Business Center in action and how it's controlling uh, Trimble, other Trimble solutions out in the field with a focus on an expressway in Cambodia. Uh, actually, ironically, what, what Alan was just showing in part of his presentation was, was the sheets that, from that project. Yep, exactly. Yep. So uh, do join us. That's July 15th, same time, um, and it's on a Wednesday. Thank you very much, all. Thank you.